Daniel chapter 10, I'm going to do everything I can to finish this chapter, actually into chapter 11, verse 1, because that's the second half of the sentence from the end of the chapter in chapter 10. Uh, but we're going to get through this, so let's pray. Father, I love the song that we sang, Never Once Have I Ever Been Alone. And that's true for all of us, Lord, so we can put the collective we. We've not been alone, and especially tonight, that's a good thing. It's a good thing, Lord, because we are surrounded. Though because of weather tonight, we're a few, we're surrounded in this room by the spirit world. And they're duking it out. And we're the prize. So, Lord, thank you for considering us worth fighting for. Thank you, Jesus. That no matter what's coming against us, no matter how the, the, the demonic world comes at us, we're never alone. We've always got you here with us by our side. And the angels, even the bad ones, Lord, they're subject to your authority. And so tonight, bind the work of the enemy. Do it, Lord, so that your word can go forward. And speak to our hearts. Prepare us for what is a difficult, even complicated study to be followed in the next two chapters by even more complicated studies. Show us how the future and knowing it changes us and prepares us for all that lies ahead. We love you, Lord, and we're grateful in the slight chance that there's someone here tonight who's not yet born again. We pray that this message would hit home in their heart and they would surrender their heart to you for your glory. We love you. We thank you. We honor you. And, oh God, that we've never once been alone. Unless we chose to walk away from you, we've never once been alone. For that, oh God, give us faith and strength and courage and make us more grateful than ever before. We pray these things in your beautiful name. Amen. Now, probably when you came to church tonight, you didn't think about a fight going on. Now, again, we got a small crowd tonight. The weather's bad out there. But make no mistake, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of beings here. We just can't see them. It's the battle going on in the spirit realm. And as I mentioned in my prayer, we're the prize. God sends the good angels to protect us. God has a word for us tonight. He wants us to hear it and to receive it into our hearts. At the same time, the bad spirits in this room, they're the ones that don't want us to have anything at all, to get anything at all from what God's word has for us tonight. In our study tonight, we get a look sort of behind the scenes of the spiritual realm. We see things that we wouldn't expect. We see things that are going on. But most of all, we see the love and the protection of Jesus Christ. It's a long study. Let's get right to it. But prepare your hearts to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to you. Chapter 10, the prophecy of Daniel. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation, this is not a dream, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, as God's word always is, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. Now I want you to notice that the first verse is written in the third person. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. Everything else is written in the first Persian, in the first person. Daniel wrote this, but it's just that this is a preface to what is the two most complicated and detailed chapters, I think, in all of Scripture. Daniel's chapter 11 and 12 tell the history of the world from Daniel's perspective all the way to that which is still future from our perspective with minute detail, and I think it's just God saying, I'm going to close this book by making sure that everybody knows that I'm the only one that can tell the future. It is so precise in detail. 
it is so accurately and has been up to the parts that are still yet future so accurately fulfilled by people who couldn't possibly know the future apart from a word from God or this revelation from God. But it is staggering in its scope. It is even more staggering in its accuracy. And Daniel wrote it. We will talk about that several times in the next three chapters. Now, the year here is 536 B.C. This is the latest date given for any of Daniel's visions. It has been three years, roughly three years, since the vision of Gabriel and the wonderful passage of Scripture that we talked about last week in chapter 9. By this point, Daniel's about to die. He's about 85 to 90 years old. And tonight's chapter, I think, is just included to tell us, to show us what's going on in the background of spiritual warfare. That's why we're taken behind the scenes of the things in the heavens. Now, this is a passage of scripture, a vision, a revelation that is terrifying to Daniel. I hope it is to you. You know, sometimes we want to know the future, or at least we think we want to know the future. But sometimes that future contains things that we're not ready to hear. Daniel has no idea what's in store. And we're going to see the physical impact, not, not just the spiritual impact, but the physical impact it has on him. There's nothing fun, nor is there anything funny about spiritual warfare. You know, we sort of approach it in a lot of our church culture so casually. It's like, I bind you, devil. And we got people shouting and yelling and and acting like they're in charge of the spirit realm. And I order them to do this and they do it. None of that's true. I've dealt with demon-possessed people in the past on occasion. It is the worst thing that's ever happened in ministry. The things of the spirit realm, especially when the evil spirits are involved and we're involved in these fights, the things that are going on in your background are things, believe me, that we don't necessarily want to know. Now, as we begin the final chapters of this book, be aware, as I mentioned, that this room is filled with spirit beings and their purpose, depending on where they're from, are either to help the word of God hit home in your heart or to prevent the word of God from hitting home in your heart. This revelation is that staggering. And again, this isn't a dream. It's not a vision. This is a revelation that knocked Daniel off his feet. He says in verse 2, at that time, I, Daniel, I think Daniel's trying to make a point that I am the author of this book. It still amazes me that people will say, well, I don't believe Daniel wrote it. He couldn't tell the future with that kind of specificity. But I, Daniel, Jesus, remember, affirmed that Daniel was the author and quoted Daniel. I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food. No meal, I'm sorry, no meat or wine touched my lips. And I use no lotions at all until the three weeks are over. Now, obviously, this revelation is so consuming, so overwhelming for Daniel that he's mourning. And as he's mourning for these three weeks, and we'll see what the tie-in of the three weeks is in a moment, he's a man in prayer, and here he introduces fasting as well. Now, fasting is not, and I'm not going to make this a Bible study about fasting tonight, but fasting is not a guarantee that God will answer our prayers. Too often we think, well, I'll fast and pray and God will have to answer my prayers. That's not the thing. God doesn't honor a hungry body or a deprived body. God honors a right heart. Fasting is simply denying the flesh. If you want to know more about fasting, Isaiah chapter 58 is the definitive chapter in all of Scripture about what real fasting is. So fasting is just a denial of the flesh. Andrew Murray said this, Prayer is the hand with which we grasp the invisible. Fasting is the other hand with which we let go of the visible. I think that's pretty insightful. We fast simply to say, Lord, I'm willing to deny my flesh. I need clarity on an issue. Or there's such a burden on my heart. And we're going to find that this is a burden on Daniel's heart. And there are times when God will give you such a burden 
that you feel the need to deny yourself of earthly comforts or the things that you need. Most often we think of fasting in terms of food, but there are lots of other kinds of fasts. And Daniel simply says, I, I, I took no choice food. I didn't eat any meat or no wine touched my lips. In other words, I'm serious about this revelation, this burden that God has given me in my heart. Now, a word about burdens, and we use words like that to sound spiritual. God put a burden on my heart. But, but God will do that. I hope every single man and woman here tonight and all of those who are watching, I hope and pray that God has given you a burden for the lost. That's a burden. What do we do with those burdens? We pray. And sometimes we fast. And we're asking God, Lord, the, the, the burden that you've given me in my heart for this person or for this group of people or for this thing, those are things that we have to take before the Lord continually because we want answers. When God gives you a burden, there's a reason. I've shared with you in the past that when God gave me the burden for Malta Medical, and I began praying all those years ago for Malta Medical, this idea, and I didn't even know it was Malta Medical at the beginning, didn't know that's what we were going to call it. The burden I had was for people who had no health care. And I thought, what an opportunity, Lord, for you to be able to minister to people physically. Luke did that in the gospel, uh, his gospel. He did that in the book of Acts. And Lord, we want to be able to do that to people, ministering to them physically so that we have the opportunity to minister to them spiritually. And that was a burden that we had for a long time. It took 12 years from the moment that the Lord put that burden on my heart until we opened the door at Malta Medical. But when God gives you a burden, He wants you to pray about that burden. He wants you to be active. And whatever it is that He's asking you to do, to satisfy that burden. Daniel had a burden in his heart that even he couldn't explain. If somebody were to come up to Daniel and say, Daniel, you look like you're just a little bit out of it. What, what's wrong? Daniel wouldn't have been able to say anything. This is so horrible. What he's seeing is so unspeakably terrifying that he wouldn't have been able, even at this point, to describe it. And so he set out to seek the Lord on it, to determine the meaning of the revelation. The angel that we're going to meet in verse 12 will acknowledge that Daniel's heart was right when he began his fast. In other words, his motives were right in understand, wanting to understand the vision. I also want you to understand that fasting never obligates God to act on our behalf, but a right heart always does. A right heart always does. Now, there's lots of reasons for Daniel mourning here. There are reasons he would understand and many other reasons that he wouldn't understand. And when we get to chapters 11 and 12, we're going to see a lot of those things that he couldn't possibly have had any idea about. But all he knows now is there's this heaviness in his heart and all he can do is mourn and he's going to mourn for three weeks. Let's talk about some of the things that Daniel would have known he was mourning about. He certainly would have been concerned for the exiles who had returned less than a year before this vision to rebuild the temple under Ezra and Zerubbabel. He would have mourned because although there were almost 50,000 exiles that returned, we have to remember that there were hundreds of thousands of Jews that were taken into captivity in Babylon. And when they were set free to go back, 50,000 sounds like a pretty impressive number to us. But 50,000 out of hundreds of thousands means that most of the Jews had let the world of Babylon capture their hearts. And Daniel would be sad about that. Now remember, Daniel will never see Jerusalem again. It would have been the desire of his heart. And he would like to think that every Jew that was taken captive into Babylon, given the opportunity to go back, would be able to go back. And Daniel said, look, I want to go back, but I can't. God hasn't released me more on that in a moment. But you should be back. And so his heart would mourn. Not only that the exiles were in danger because the walls were down and the condition of things was dangerous and the work that had started under Ezra and Zerubbabel had sort of fizzled out 
over this year's time. People were afraid. They were building homes for themselves. But they had neglected the work that God sent them back to do, and that's to repair the house of God. Daniel would have great hopes that the temple would be restored and the people would once again be able to worship God. But he would have heard reports that opposition had arisen and that things weren't going smoothly. And all of this was a long time before Nehemiah had the same burden placed on his heart and he would return to Jerusalem in order to help rebuild the walls so that the people who had returned would be safe. Now, let me suggest a couple of other things. And some of this is speculation, but I don't think when we get in the next two chapters, I don't think that it's crazy speculation. These are things that I really believe that Daniel would have to try to understand, things he would be mourning about. Daniel, as I've said many times in our studies, was taken from his homeland never to return. I think there were times Daniel, as righteous as Daniel was, I think there were times when Daniel would think, that's not fair. 50,000 got to go back, but I didn't get to go back. And he would be homesick as an old man now. He would have wanted to return. But, but remember, he's here on a mission from God because we wouldn't have these last three chapters had he returned more than a year earlier with the exiles. We would think, well, Daniel's been so oppressed, he's been so persecuted, and he's been so faithful. God, why wouldn't you let him go? And because Daniel was a human, I think there was some of that going on in Daniel's heart. Daniel will die soon, but without this book, the Israelites, the exiles who returned especially, wouldn't be encouraged to carry on the work. And so Daniel would have to come to a place where he recognized that his mission was more important than personal mercy. Maybe if Daniel would have begged God, I, I, I want to go back, I want to go back, I want to die in Jerusalem. Maybe God would have let him do it. But then he would have raised up somebody else. Daniel simply did what he did his whole life. He remained faithful to the mission God had given him. I won't belabor the point but every one of us, we need to remain faithful to the mission that God has given us. We all have gifts, we all have a calling, and we all need to put mission ahead of anything and everything else because, as I say often, the days are short and Jesus is coming soon. Had he left a year earlier, he wouldn't have been studying the book of Daniel. He didn't know. I'm sorry, the book of Jeremiah. He, he didn't know all the things that were to go on. I've always been intrigued by the New Testament verses that talk about the Old Testament prophets who are searching the scriptures to find out the times and the events of the things they were studying. But it was revealed to them that they weren't serving themselves. They were serving those of us who would come later. In other words, Daniel would never get the answers. And I think that would be a source of warning in Daniel's heart. But there's even more. I think another reason Daniel would mourn is because he would learn for the first time in detail just how much his people Israel would suffer in the future. This is a revelation that goes all the way down to Jesus' return. And as he sees these stories unfold in this revelation, he would see the un believable, unbearable suffering of Israel in the details that we're going to study in chapters 11 and 12. We know later in this chapter that Daniel's vision concerned the far future. The Hebrew word carries with it the meaning of a long time under great distress. Now think about what that means. It is possible and I'm only going to say possible with this one, but it's possible that Daniel would have seen images of the six million Jews that were murdered in the Holocaust of World War II. How would Daniel react to that? How would you deal with what you had to see 
It's possibly saw that. It's likely, I think, that Daniel saw the slaughter of Jews after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and then going all the way down into Jesus' time under the emperor of Rome, Caesar Nero. It's possible that he saw visions of roads into Jerusalem lined with Roman crosses, with Jews being crucified on them. It's even possible that in this revelation, Daniel saw Jesus hanging on a cross, dying for the sins of the world. He would have no way to understand that, but he would see it. And he would hear, perhaps, in this revelation, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. No wonder he mourned, no wonder he lay sick. But he would also learn, of course, that God would take care of his people. And so Daniel would be forced to leave this terrible vision, knowing for sure that God's promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, to David, that those promises would be kept, they would be fulfilled. He would know for sure that Messiah would come and rule and reign from the city of David, Jerusalem. In other words, in this revelation, there's a lot of good news, but it is, I think, a little bit more significant, the amount of bad news that he would have to deal with in this astonishing vision On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of finest gold around his waist. His body was like a chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Now, because of this description, there are a lot of people, some of them I call friends, Calvary Chapel colleagues, who believe that this angel, because he so is similar in description to Jesus' description in Revelation chapter 1, they will look at this angel and say, this is Jesus, this is a Christophany or a theophany of Jesus before the manger. Obviously, this was the greatest vision, the most awesome vision, and I use that word sparingly, that Daniel ever received. And people would say, well, then this has to be Jesus. Now, I'm going to explain to you why I don't believe it can possibly be Jesus. So who is this mighty angel? There's some who, as I said, who says Jesus. Others say it's Michael, but Michael is identified later in this chapter. and He's seemingly distinct from this angel. We've seen other great angels, like Daniel's seeing here, Ezekiel, in chapter 9 of his prophecy. He saw mighty angels in linen. Some others would suggest this is Gabriel, but that too is only speculation. This seems to be sort of out of Gabriel's wheelhouse here. So who is it? Well, it's just another powerful angel. And that's why we need to understand what's going on in the spirit realm, whether it's good angels or bad angels, demons, fallen angels, There are angels of all kinds of different sizes. The sixth verse of Jude's one chapter epistle indicates that there were angels, bad ones, fallen angels, that were so uncontrollable, so incorrigible, that they'd been locked up in the abyss, in a dungeon in the center of the earth, until they were going to be let loose at the end of time. We'll study that in our study of the Great Tribulation in the book of Revelation on Friday night. So there's terrible angels, but there's also good, strong, and powerful angels. One thing for sure that we can take from all of this is that Daniel had lived a long time serving God, and he paid in some ways a steep price to do so. He suffered. He was persecuted. But when God wanted Daniel to get a message, God made sure that the message got through. Daniel is going to hear this message directly from this great angel. 
This story provides the opportunity for us to talk about things going on behind the scenes. I don't know how many of you or if any of you have had angelic encounters that you're aware of. But I think there are times when God gives us a little bit of the curtain pulled back and we can see those things. I'm convinced on at least two occasions for sure and probably another occasion, I've had direct angelic interference to keep me and Paula safe in another case, to keep somebody else in the church safe who was surely going to die. And I think those angels were there. Now, most of you have had angelic interference and didn't even know it. You start to pray and you get all these ugly thoughts in your mind. You sit down and want to open your Bible and you can't even think straight. And, and all of a sudden you think about all the things you have to do. Your dumb cell phone starts ringing. I think there's demonic interference. When we set our hearts and minds to seek the will of God, there's going to be interference. And we've got to understand the nature of the battle. And so clearly some very powerful angels fell. It is equally clear that some very powerful angels maintained their first estate and are serving God. And they're involved in the battle that's going on in our lives all the time. And we need to be aware. We, we don't need to give the devil too much credit. We don't need to look for the devil under every rock. We don't blame him for every little thing that's going on. But we have to know he's real. We have to respect his power. And we have to know that he has a lot of demonic help in trying to destroy the work, the very work that God has done in your heart and the work that he wants to do in the future. This is obviously a very powerful, high-ranking angel. Now, as angels go, do you, any of you remember the TV series Touched by an Angel? Um, if, if you really want to see how the angelic world works, go back and watch reruns. The one thing they did really, really well in that series was to depict this battle that's going on. And whenever the devil showed up, now, the devil was John Schroeder, Schneider. Schneider? John Schneider. Okay, he's a good guy. He's handsome. He's charismatic. Well, he was the devil. And whenever the devil showed up, Paul Winfield showed up. Paul Winfield was Michael the Archangel. And that's what we're seeing in this chapter unfold before us. Michael, we're going to find out, is Israel's prince or Israel's protector. He is the archangel, the highest ranking angel in all of the heavens. The counterpart to Lucifer, who we call the devil, who has fallen, and evidently throughout the centuries they've been duking it out with one another. And Michael, because he's fighting with God, and for God, always prevails. But it's always a battle. More on that in just a moment. He says, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone. Don't just read by that quickly. A lot of us are going to feel like we've been left alone when we're serving Jesus faithfully. Remember the words of the song that they sang, Never once have I ever been alone. It may feel like it at times. I think there are times when God constructs the battles that we have in the spirit realm. I think he constructs them so that we feel alone. So we've got to get to that place where I can't do this, Lord. I need help. And that's when God sends a deliverer. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. So much for the cute, chubby little angels floating around in crowd, clouds with bows and arrows. One of the demonic encounters that Paul and I have had together was in a nursing home, and there was a woman named Judy who had to be 100 years old. 
And every time we would show up, Judy would start making noise and going sort of crazy. Her eyes would do these wild things. And Paula would be singing and I would be teaching the Bible and, and, and Judy would just go back and forth. I never knew a wheelchair could move so quickly with such an old woman. And one day she was going absolutely berserk. And Paula walked over after she was singing. I started to pray, and then I was going to start the Bible study. And Judy started making noises that I can't even describe to you. And Paula, because she's Paula, she went over and she said, Oh, Judy. And Paula just touched her, put her hand on her shoulder. Oh, Judy. And instantly Paula got sick. I mean, so sick. I've never seen her like that. And I was aware immediately what was going on. And so I went over, told Paula to go out of the room. I went over and I got this close to Judy's face. The sound she was making, the smell of the encounter. And all I kept doing was, you look at me in the eyes. You know who I am. You know who I serve. And Judy just started screaming and making these almost banshee type noises. And finally... She did a U-turn, and that wheelchair went out faster than it came in. These are not pleasant encounters. But we needn't be afraid of them. Don't seek them. Don't pursue them. But we needn't be afraid of them. Daniel had no strength left. His face turned deathly pale. If you have a King James, it says he lost his comeliness. It's like Daniel said, physically I became ugly and I was helpless. Then I heard him, this angel, speaking. And as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He couldn't even get up. He's on all fours and his body is trembling. And he said, Daniel... And here's one place the NIV really misses it. It says, you are highly esteemed. This is you are greatly beloved. I want you to think about that. The two men in the Bible who are called beloved are Daniel and the Apostle John. Now it's interesting to me because the angel is the one who tells Daniel, you're highly loved, you're, you're greatly beloved. John just named himself that. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. But the idea is these are the ones who got the great end times revelations. You want to hear from the Lord, you've got to love him. You've got to love him with all of your heart and God will speak to your heart. He delights to do so. Daniel's on all fours. His body is trembling. He's lost his, his comeliness. He's turned ugly, he says. And he has no idea what to do with this unbelievable vision. And God's response is sending this angel to say, Daniel, you are greatly beloved. It's the second time, by the way, he's called that. There's another one coming up. Consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up. I like that. Don't be on all fours. I know you're weak, but... Consider what I'm about to say to you. Now remember, the details of this revelation are chapters 11 and 12. So right now, all Daniel's got is this, this wave of sickness, this weakness, the trembling that has consumed him. And the angel says, Daniel, because you are greatly loved, stand up. Stand up. Now please hear my heart here. There are a lot of Christians who are slow to get into the battle because they're afraid of the spiritual warfare they're going to encounter. We need to remember, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes would not perish but have everlasting life. What that means is that every one of us, if an angel would appear to us, this would be his message. Ron, you who are beloved by God, you're beloved by our God. And here's what he tells us to do. Stand up. We encounter 
difficulties in this world. We tell people about Jesus they don't want to hear. We tell people that behavior is sinful. You need to repent and turn to God. And they get in our faces and we cower. So whether we're dealing with humans, we're dealing with demonic spirits, it's all a spiritual battle. And because we're loved by God, please hear this, God says, stand up. Don't shrink back. Don't be afraid to tell people about Jesus. Stand up. I'm with you. And in this case, this powerful angel is with him, and he's saying, Daniel, stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel. Is there anyone in this room who thinks that worked? Not only is Daniel terrified by this vision that he's seen, and when we get into it in the next couple of chapters, you'll understand what was so terrifying. But now he's saying, Daniel, don't be afraid of me. Every one of us, if we were to see a real angel, we write books about him or read books about him, and we think, oh, that would be wonderful. Oh, God, give me this vision. If you really saw an angel sent from heaven, we too would be on our face or at best on all fours. That's how terrifying they are. Now, why are they terrifying? Not because of the message. They're terrifying because these are God's holy angels. And they have power that we can't even begin to comprehend. But just the holiness of these beings would terrify us and and, and bring us to our faces, cowering in fear. It's interesting to me that in heaven, even the angels can't look at God. With wings they cover their eyes, with wings they cover their feet, because they can't stand on holy ground. And they're God's holy angels. Believe me, all of this interest we have in our culture about angels is misunderstood. God has angels at the ready to help you and you won't ever see them. But they're there just as surely as this angel was here for Daniel. And then he says something that's amazing to me. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself, that's recognizing the earlier fast that we started with, And to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. Now make sure you understand what this is saying. This is saying at the very moment Daniel began to pray. At the very moment God heard his prayer. Now we also know, Jesus told us, that if God hears our prayers, then we have what we've asked for. The moment he began to pray. Now three weeks have gone by. There's been no answer to this prayer. Daniel has been sick. Now he's visited by this powerful angel. And the angel's message basically is, whew, it was a fight getting here. But you need to know, Daniel, you're so beloved by God that the moment you begin to pray, he answered your prayer. The moment you begin to pray. I don't know about you, but there's times when I feel like the moment I begin to pray about something, God's not listening. There are times when I think, how long is it going to take to to answer this prayer? There are times I'm pleading on some of your behalf when I know you're going through difficult things. I'm just saying, oh God, please. And, And you know, sometimes begging is just that, God, please. I'm pleading with you. We need to know that those prayers that come from deep in your heart, a heart that really loves God, those prayers are heard and they're answered even if the answer to those prayers isn't instant. You all know our story. Paula prayed for me for 13 years. But the moment she began to pray, with the right heart, those prayers were heard. And God began the work that was required to answer those prayers the way that she wanted them answered. For those of you who have a hard time believing that prayer really matters questions I get on the radio program. Well, God knows everything is happening, so why do we pray? Because prayer matters. Prayer changes things. 
And this is a prayer that's answered. And this is a prayer that when we get the details in this prayer, literally gives us minute details about the future of the world that we live in. Prayer is not just some useless spiritual routine. If you want your prayers answered, you can't casually throw up flare prayers. You can't pray only when you need something from God. You can't pray only when there's really something that you think you need or can't do without. you got to know the one to whom you're praying. And remember, the primary focus of prayer is not to get God to change his mind, but it's to get you to change your mind and your heart to agree with him so that he can answer your prayers. We would say to God, give Daniel a break. He's had such a tough life and now he's near 90 years old and he's going to die soon. But this is a prayer that God wanted to answer. So what happened for 21 days? Look at verse 13. But the prince, and this is a word that means the captain or high ranking in order, and this is a specific reference to different levels of angels, both bad ones and good ones. Paul says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, and he describes different levels of angels in heaven. But the captain of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days. Now that's an amazing thing. This angel is so powerful that Daniel's on his face, his body trembling, he's become ugly. And yet this angel was held up in the heavenly realms for 21 days by the prince of the Persian kingdom. Now clearly this is Satan. We need to understand that. This is Satan. And there are some, and I don't necessarily agree, but there are some who say there are territorial demons and, 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 and angels, fallen angels over particular parts and territories in the world. I don't think that's what this is suggesting at all. But Persia, that center, was sort of the, the, the center of the world. The Medes and the Persians uh, were, were, were one of the world powers. And I think what he's saying is that, well, it seems like we're battling the Medes and the Persians or later the Greeks. We're really battling the enemy of our souls. And I think it's also an indication that when we humble ourselves and pray and seek the Lord with all of our heart, then we've been dragged into a huge battle going on in the spiritual realm. Here's what we need to remember. God always comes to the rescue of those of us who pray with the right heart. He did it for Daniel. He'll do it for us. Look at the next sentence. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, same level of angel as the prince of Persia. Now there's some who say there's only one archangel in the Bible. That's Michael. Arch over all of the other angels. Lucifer clearly was his equivalent before he fell. I personally believe that Gabriel is an archangel, but we're never told that specifically. But this is the very top level of angel. And this Michael, Israel's prince, came to help me because I was determined, or I'm sorry, because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now this to me is breathtaking. This angel was sent on a mission from God. And he's going to make a beeline to Daniel. The minute he started praying, God knew what was coming from his heart and honored his humility, honored his faithfulness, and sent the answer to his prayer. He, God didn't want Daniel to suffer, but he sent this really, really powerful angel. And evidently, on the way to Daniel, he encountered the devil. And the devil was able to detain him for 21 days. You talk about a pay-per-view event. I mean, think about that fight going on in the background. There have been times in the past where I've had a very strong sense that some of my prayers were being held up in the spiritual realms. And those are times when you've got to push through. Those are times when you've got to pray with even more urgency. We don't stop praying because, well, for 21 days I've been praying the same thing and I didn't get any answers. No, we keep 
praying. Because those are the prayers that God wants to answer. Those are the prayers that are going to bring him glory. Those are the prayers that are going to enable you to see the hand of God move in your life. And we've got to keep praying through those things. Now, a lot of prayer, and I say this to you a lot because I don't want anybody here to be intimidated by prayer. Most of your prayer is just you and God talking. It's conversational. But there are times when you know you're in the middle of a war. And those are the times when you've got to, fig- figuratively speaking, roll up your sleeves. If you've got the gift of tongues, use it and join the fight. The Father, Jesus ever living to make intercession for us, is fighting for us from above. And we're fighting for his will to be done here on earth from below. And there are times when you've simply got to keep on fighting. There are times when I pray for some of you and I feel like there is a demonic presence whose intention is to destroy you. And that's when the gift of intercession comes into play. Now people say, well, that's very dramatic, but, but, but it happens in heaven. What makes us think it doesn't happen here on earth? And in this particular case, God called Michael out of the bullpen because even Satan can't overcome Michael. Neither can Michael overcome Satan, by the way, without God's help. But they get ready to fight it out in the spiritual realm. And every time we're dealing with Israel, And remember these visions, while they'll tell our future as well, these visions deal with Israel, as does the entire last day scenario from the Great Tribulation. All of that deals with just Israel. Michael is involved during the Great Tribulation. Michael is going to be one really busy archangel. So when you face spiritual interference, spiritual warfare when you're praying, don't give up. Press through. God sent the answer to Daniel's prayer on day one, and yet in the heavens that answer was held up for 21 days. And because this was the devil, God required Michael to be dispatched. Now we know that Satan is called the ruler or the prince or the little G God of this world. Michael is the only one that can withstand him. Now we know this angel could not be Jesus. I told you there are reasons that the angel that's letting Daniel know all this could not be Jesus. Well, here's the basic reasons. Because Lucifer, as powerful as he is, he certainly couldn't have held Jesus up in the heavenly realms. There's no way Jesus would need help. The devil is a created being. Jesus is the creator of that being. They're not anywhere close to the same level of power. Jesus' power as creator God is infinitely greater. And we have a tendency to look at spiritual warfare like, well, Satan's bad, Jesus is good, and they're duking it out. That's not the case. Satan cannot stand against our Jesus. Michael and Satan are the equal opposites. Not Jesus and Satan. Michael and Satan are the equal opposites. Jude chapter 1 verse 9, But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. In Revelation chapter 12 verse 7, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. So that's the war that's going on all the time. When I refer to the beginning of the study to the, the, to the hundreds, maybe thousands of spirit beings in this room right now, they're fighting over you. Don't you like being worth fighting for? No demonic spirit 
No fallen angel can do anything to you that God isn't in control of. And Jesus is fighting for you. If he's got to send an angel, he'll send an angel. But again, we need not be afraid. It's not fun. It's not something we want to do. But we need not be afraid of spiritual warfare. I repeat, Jesus and Satan are not equals. Jesus is the one who has all the control. Now imagine if the sight of this angel took all of Daniel's strength, and yet this angel is not as powerful as Michael. Imagine what would happen to us if any of us were able to see Michael. Believe me, he doesn't look like Paul Winfield. There's been a lot of times that Michael has been dispatched to protect Israel. Just in the day and age, the time that we live in, Israel's remarkable victories. The Six-Day War in 1967. The war that would follow in 1973 when Israel was so outgunned. When neighbors whose only desire was to wipe them off the face of the earth. And when they came against Israel with all of their strength, suddenly it turned into a rout, but not for the enemies of God's people, but for Israel. And Israel's funny. You know, Israel's, um, they have a reputation for being really tough. We don't take any nonsense. You know, we fight and we're, we're going to defend ourselves. We're tough. They think they're tough. They haven't done anything. God's done it all. Like when I grew up, there used to be a lot of big guys on my football team. And I could talk a lot of smack. And I was always getting in trouble. But anybody wanted to mess with me, they had to go through all those people. And so I would act like I was really tough. I wasn't tough. Israel's not tough. But Michael can fight. And Michael's been the one who's helping them. There's a, a war coming in Ezekiel 38 and 39 when Michael is going to deliver a miraculous victory to Israel against all possible odds. So Michael's job, the job he does well, is to protect Israel. He says, Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come, and that's the latter days in the far distant future. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. The King James says, I was dumb. He couldn't talk. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I'm overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I am helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Now imagine this picture of this near 90-year-old man in this kind of condition. So again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. I love that, and I think about an angel ministering to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then earlier, following his wilderness temptation, by the devil himself, an angel was sent to minister. We also know that it was an angel who ministered to the Apostle Paul. Well, Daniel had that experience in time and space before either one of them. So here's the message. Do not be afraid, O man, and here it is, greatly beloved again. It says highly esteemed in the NIV. That's a horrible translation. And this is peace. Be strong, now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. Now, this is just kind of a sneak preview. The prince of Greece is 200 years in the future. And clearly this indicates that behind the Grecian Empire as well, there was demonic, if not satanic, influence. But first I will tell you what is written in the Book of Truth. And then he says, no one supports me 
against them except Michael, your prince, and the rest of the parenthesis. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. I'll close with this. The, the reference to the book of truth. You need to know that everything we're going to study. Now, these are not going to be thrilling studies. You're not going to be in the edge of your seat. But they're so important for the detail. Every single thing is true. And we're going to see so much of it that has come true exactly as prophesied by Daniel. But what that does for us is strengthens us for the things that have not yet been fulfilled because they're going to come true exactly as prophesied by Daniel as well. We need never to apologize for our Bibles. It is not only the book of truth. There is no other truth. It is the answer to all of the power of the demonic forces in this world. And we need not be afraid of evil because your Bible declares... Each and every one of us, in Christ, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We needn't worry about the prince of America. If you don't think there is demonic power behind the scenes in our country, you haven't been paying attention. What do we do? accept the burden that God has given us and we pray and we pray some more and we ask Jesus to intervene knowing that our prayers are heard instantly and at just the right time those prayers will be answered. Our next two studies will be a little bit tedious but I think a whole lot encouraging because we're going to see the power of God firsthand. Let's pray.